Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be looking at some of the important ligaments and other bony structures in the cervical spine. And so mainly on this slide, we're going to be focusing on this picture on the left. This is actually uh, the lateral view of the right side of the cervical spine. So let's first start by identifying some of the bones here. So of course up here at the top we have the skull. Now all the way back here on the posterior aspect, again I know it's posterior because this is the mandible over here, this bump right here is the external occipital protuberance. Um, you can actually palpate this bone if you actually put your finger back there right on the midline on the posterior aspect of the skull. You can actually feel that and there's a reason I, I mentioned this landmark where to come back to it with the ligaments. So if we follow from the external occipital protuberance along the base of the skull, it leads us to this structure right here. Uh, this is the mastoid process. Now the mastoid process looks like it's articulating with the atlas right here, but actually the atlas articulates uh, with a bone of the skull that's actually more medial. It's actually, you can't see it because of the mastoid process, but medial to this at some point we would actually have the occipital condyle. And it's actually the occipital condyle that articulates with the atlas. So this bone right here, this is the first of the cervical vertebrae. This is the atlas, or C1. The one beneath that, this is the axis, or C2. Now C1 and C2 are the only ones that actually have a specific name. Again, the atlas is called the atlas because it balances this large spherical structure, of course, which is the skull on top of it. And according to Greek mythology, Atlas was a guy who held the earth on his shoulders. So just like Atlas held the earth on his shoulders, the C1 vertebra holds the skull on its shoulders, so to speak. And beneath that is the axis. Again, the reason this is called the axis is it literally provides an axis about which the atlas can rotate. And the joint between the atlas, right here, C1, and the occipital condyles, which are not visible, is called the atlanto-occipital joint. And this joint, as we're going to see in later videos, allows several motions, uh, which include flexion, extension, and lateral flexion, also called side bending. Uh, the joint between the atlas and the axis, C1 and C2, is called the atlanoaxial joint. And this joint allows for a little bit of flexion and extension as well, but mainly rotation. There's a huge rotational component at this atlanoaxial joint. Beneath C2, these vertebra don't have specific names. But this one would be C3, this would be C4, C5, C6, and then we have C7. And one way we can tell this is C7 other than counting down is you'll notice that its spinous process, remember that's the bony part that projects posteriorly, is quite a bit larger than the one above it. Okay, so when we get to C7, we see a pretty big deviation in the length of the spinous process. So it's very large, and for that reason, uh, this one is often called the vertebral prominence, and that corresponds with the spinous process of C7. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, in terms of the spinous processes, every one of these cervical vertebrae has a spinous process except for C1. So C2 down through C7 have spinous processes, C1 actually has an equivalent structure called a posterior tubercle. Um, it actually doesn't project out very far, and so this is actually just the posterior tubercle of the atlas. Okay? You'll also notice that every one of these cervical vertebrae, including C1, down through C7, has this uh, hole on its transverse process. And this hole is called the transverse foramen. And collectively, they are the transverse foramina. And the purpose of those is for the vertebral artery to course through. And we'll talk about that in later videos. The vertebral artery actually does not course through the foramen of C7. It actually enters that at C6, goes up through 5, 4, 3, 2, and then eventually 1 as it goes inside the skull. You'll also notice here that there are intervertebral discs, but they don't exist at every single level. You'll notice the first disc starts right here, right beneath the axis. And so that's an important point. The first intervertebral disc in the spine is actually the disc between C2 and C3. So this is the C2, C3 disc. There's no disc between C1 and C2 or the occiput and C1. Okay, so here is our first one. All right. Also down here, this is the first thoracic vertebra. 
and you can actually see right here, this would actually be the facet for the first rib, and this would be the demi facet shared with that of T2 for the second rib. All right. Now, a few other things right here. This structure right here, this fibrous tissue, this is actually the joint capsule of the atlanto-occipital joint, the joint between the occipital condyles and C1. And beneath that right here, we have the joint capsule of the atlanto-axial joint between the atlas and the axis. Um, really, the joint capsules from there on move posteriorly, um, and they become the joint capsules of what we call the zygopophyseal joints. So zygopophyseal joints are really just facet joints. And they're joints between the superior and, arti and inferior articular processes of corresponding vertebrae. And so these right here, these are the joint capsules of the zygopophyseal joints of the cervical spine. We already mentioned the spinous processes here. Now we can start talking about some of the ligaments here. So this structure right here, this is actually the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. So it's not quite a ligament, it's more membranous in structure, but it's a membrane or kind of a ligament that connects the occiput to uh, the posterior tubercle and arches of the atlas. Okay. Down here, uh, this gray structure, this is actually the posterior atlantoaxial membrane. It's not labeled here, but posterior atlantoaxial membrane. Once you get below C2, those structures essentially become continuous with what's called the ligamentum flava. And that's what we have here in gray. So this gray structure right here, or dark gray, this is the ligamentum flava. Individually, they are ligamentum flavum, but collectively flava. And so that posterior atlanto-occipital membrane and posterior atlanto-axial membrane are continuous with the ligamentum flava, which really starts right here at the C2, C3 level. Okay. Then we have what are called interspinous ligaments. And let the name guide you as to what it is. It's a ligament that exists between spinous processes. So the interspinous ligament is not existing above C1. That's because if it's truly an interspinous ligament, it has to be between two spinous processes. Now technically, this structure right here really is an interspinous ligament, even though it's between the C2 spinous process and the C1 posterior tubercle. So we do have interspinous ligament right here, but generally they're going to exist between all these spinous processes. So here's one, here's another one, here's another one, and they exist through the cervical spine and down through the lumbar spine to the sacrum. Then we have what's called the ligamentum nuchi, or also called the nuchal ligament. So this is a structure that only exists in the cervical spine, and it actually exists from the base of the skull down only to C7. And I'm going to trace out the area that's defined as the nuchal ligament. So it starts here at that external occipital protuberance. And then we're going to follow it down. There's a thickened part of it posteriorly. And we follow it down literally just to the spinous process of C7, to that vertebral prominence. And then it really just connects anteriorly with the interspinous ligaments. Okay, you can actually see it's a slightly different color here. And then it goes up past the posterior tubercle to the base of the occiput and then connects back to the external occipital protuberance. That entire area right there is the ligamentum nuchi or the nuchal ligament. Now, the nuchal ligament is essentially a replacement for the supraspinous ligament in the cervical spine. The supraspinous ligament really starts once we get down to C7. And all the supraspinous ligament is, is a ligament that connects the tips of the spinous processes. So, supraspinous ligament would connect the spinous process of C7 to T1, T1 to T2, and, and so on and so forth down the spine. It's just that we don't have a supraspinous ligament above C7 because we actually have this large nuchal ligament. Now, an interesting note about the nuchal ligament is that um, in um, some cultures, it's called the paddywhack. And so the origin of that term is they actually used to take the horse nuchal ligament. So when a horse was deceased, uh, they would use this nuchal ligament and they would put it into dog treats because usually farms that had horses also had dogs. And so we have that song, Nick Knack Paddywhack Give a Dog a Bone, because the paddywhack or the nuchal ligament was actually made into dog treats or dog bones. That's where that comes from, just from horses though. 
Now over here on the right, this is a, a small portion of the thoracic spine. Again, these vertebrae look entirely different, and we're actually looking at a posterior oblique view. We can tell it's thoracic spine for a number of reasons. One, we have these demi facets right here for the ribs. Here's a rib right here. The rib articulates um, on demi facets that are shared between a vertebra above and a vertebra below. And then also the tubercle of that rib articulates with the transverse process of that vertebrae. Here's a transverse process right here, and you can actually see uh, a facet for the tubercle of that rib. Uh, it's covered up by the tubercle, and then we also have this ligament right here uh, that stabilizes that joint. That's called the costotransverse joint. But here you see a spinous process of one thoracic vertebrae. Here's another spinous process. And then the ligament between them, that's the interspinous ligament. Here's uh, the supraspinous ligament, again connecting the tips of those vertebrae. Now, over here, you actually have left transverse processes, this is the left side, and you'll notice there's a, a, a thin ligament that connects adjacent transverse processes. This is called the intertransverse ligament. Now, these are very thin ligaments and probably don't suppl supply a huge amount of stability. You'll notice that we start seeing these in the thoracic spine, but they're not really so much in the, in the cervical spine. Actually, in the cervical spine, they're replaced by muscles called intertransversaries. Intertransversaries are muscles that mostly probably act as proprioceptive muscles, um, but really they're muscles in the cervical spine. In the thoracic spine and below, we have the ligament and the intertransversary muscles. So the ligaments are a lot more well-defined in the thoracic spine. Now here's the vertebral body, and you can see here that the pedicles have been cut so we can see really inside that vertebral canal. So on the posterior aspect of the vertebral bodies, we have that posterior longitudinal ligament. And remember that the posterior longitudinal ligament, one thing that it does is helps to minimize the amount of posterior disc translations into the spinal cord. So if the disc were to herniate, it's most likely going to herniate in a posterior lateral direction, which may impair nerve root function, but we definitely want to minimize the direct posterior uh, translation or posterior herniation because that would bump into the spinal cord and produce a myelopathy, which is an injury to the spinal cord and associated pathophysiology. Now this picture really has a lot of the same stuff. The main thing I wanted to show here are the ligaments posteriorly. So here's our broad nuchal ligament. Here's the atlas C1, C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. So this is our large spinous process right here, the vertebral prominence of C7. And if you look at this large nuchal ligament, what you'll actually see is that a lot of these interspinous ligaments actually seem to blend with the nuchal ligament. Okay? Um, and that's important to know because if we ever have tension on the nuchal ligament, it will also pull on uh, the interspinous ligaments. And those interspinous ligaments are also connected to the ligamentum flava. And so we have this network here where if we have tension on the nuchal ligament, it'll cause tension on the interspinous ligaments, which will therefore cause tension on the ligamentum flava. And if that tension is directed posteriorly, it'll create space inside the vertebral canal for the spinal cord. And there are some movements that actually accomplish this. And this is not unique to the cervical spine. We see this in the thoracic and the lumbar spine as well, especially in the lumbar spine during Valsalva maneuvers. So one more picture here, and this is really just to illustrate some points here um, of where we have certain ligaments and membranes that are continuous with others. Okay, so a few things here in blue. This is anterior. So remember I mentioned the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. Well, here we have the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. So this is, again, between the occiput and the atlas, but it's more membranous in nature. Uh, once you get down, it becomes continuous with this ligament, which is the anterior longitudinal ligament, which runs on the anterior surface of the vertebral bodies all the way down the spine. So up at the top, it's just anterior lano-occipital membrane, but it becomes the anterior longitudinal ligament. Okay? Um, also note, there is an anterior lano-axial membrane. It's just not shown here. But it is also continuous with the anterior longitudinal ligament. Um, back here, we have the posterior lano-occipital membrane. And here's the posterior lano-axial membrane. And again, those become continuous with the ligamentum flavum. And again, the ligamentum flavum continues all the way down the spine. 
in light green back here, this is our nuchal ligament. Remember the nuchal ligament, or ligamentum nuchi, extends from the external occipital protuberance way up here at the base of the posterior skull and continues down to the vertebral prominence, C7. Beneath that, we have supraspinous ligaments. Okay, so again, the nuchal ligament, once it gets to C7, it becomes continuous with those supraspinous ligaments as they run all the way down the spine. And then the last thing, is this tectorial membrane. The tectorial membrane is really in the middle. And when we talk more about C1 and C2 anatomy specifically, we'll look more at that tectorial membrane. But note that the tectorial membrane, like these other membranes, eventually becomes a ligament um, once it gets below C2, and that ligament's called the posterior longitudinal ligament. And that existed, remember, on the posterior surface of the vertebral bodies and helped to prevent herniations of the disc posteriorly, now, mostly posteriorly because uh, it's directly blocking that disc from going into the vertebral canal. Okay, so hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of a lot of the anatomy of the cervical spine and also the ligaments that are involved. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.